we shouldn't be so fixated on a future with Facebook that we we are afraid to create uh, the rules we need to rein in power and money. Hi, I'm Taylor Owen, and this is Big Tech. So it's only been two weeks since the siege on the Capitol. But for Donald Trump, these past few weeks must have felt like a lifetime. We've just witnessed a truly solemn moment in American history. The House of Representatives has reached the threshold for making Donald J. Trump the only president of the United States to be impeached for a second time. This seems to be the final nail in the coffin for Trump. Many of his supporters in the GOP have turned against him. He's been impeached for a second time. And he's finally, finally been kicked off of social media. In addition to Twitter, Trump has been banned or restricted from Apple, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Google, Amazon, Pinterest, TikTok, YouTube, Reddit, Twitch, Stripe, Discord, and Shopify. (laughs) At first, Trump's deplatforming prompted a collective sigh of relief. After four years of using Twitter to incite violence, stoke conspiracies, and disseminate disinformation, kicking him off the platforms just felt like the right thing to do. Among conservatives, there was a predictable First Amendment backlash to this. But there were other people expressing their discomfort with these moves as well. People who rarely agree with the commentators on Fox News, like Angela Merkel. Some have falsely interpreted Merkel's remarks as a call for unbridled free speech. But really, she's just calling for government regulation of speech. And she's not alone. In fact, I think that Trump's bans actually distract from the systemic failures they represent, as well as the real solution. Democratic governance, not self-governance. Few people understand this better than Joan Donovan. Joan is the research director of the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard University. She began her career looking at how white supremacists used online DNA tests to prove their purity. And in the years since, she's become one of the world's foremost experts on online misinformation. Joan spends a lot of her time embedded in the dark corners of the web to see how misinformation spreads. And in the months leading up to January 6th, Joan had been following the Stop the Steal conspiracy and knew something big was coming. We spoke about the attack on Capitol Hill and what it tells us about our media ecosystem and how to govern it. Here's Joan Donovan. Right before the insurgency, you tweeted, protest is a crucible. Today we will witness the full break of the MAGA movement from representative politics. So I I wonder if we could start by just talking a bit about how you knew this was going to erupt in the way it did and what did you watch over the past few months that made you really know what was going to happen here? Mm -hmm. So uh, for the last decade, I've uh, studied social movements. And if you study social movements, you you can kind of tell three to six months into the future, what are the possible potential outcomes if movements uh, continue in the way that they have been behaving. So Mm -hmm. as Stop the Steal started to coalesce into a street movement, had rallies, uh, was bringing together people like Ali Alexander with Alex Jones, with Nick Fuentes, if people don't know him, he's a sort of heir to the alt-right of Richard Mm -hmm. Spencer. He's he's an online streamer. As these influencers started to show up in public space, they started to show up at Capitol buildings and Mm. they were showing up at state legislatures. Uh, This is happening in tandem with the carnival uh, that Rudy Giuliani had put on display of continuous performative litigation. So this is an immediate, in the moment immediately after the, I mean, within the weeks after the election. The weeks after the election, but you have to understand that all of this is really about media manipulation. It's about creating the conditions by which people feel as if, if they don't do something, nothing will change, right? Mm -hmm. So movements 
The most important moment in a movement is when they feel that there is nothing left to do institutionally. There is no avenue forward by which they can win. And the only other option is chaos and violence. Hmm. And uh, when movements reach those that level of desperation, uh, it can happen in two ways. One is calls for accountability, thinking here about Black Lives Matter and all of the different ways in which uh, activists have tried to make police accountable uh, for years in L.A. I was part of the Black Lives Matter movement of activists in L.A. who would wake up at 6 a.m. every Tuesday to go and hold police accountability, uh, you know, testimony at the police oversight committee, you know, just time and time again, trying to push the institutional levers. And when all of that fails movements become very uh, chaotic because it's very hard to harness that kind of uh, despair and grief. Mm. The second way it can happen, though, is exactly the way that we saw, which is through disinformation. Mm. And if you can create the appearance that all avenues have been litigated and exhausted. Right, because that never happened, right? Like the election was (laughs) an institutional pathway. That- exactly. But if you have 60 court cases where people online are saying every day uh, they're trying and Trump is being thwarted and mm-hmm. then this notion of seizure, this like we tried the institutional way and it didn't work, mm-hmm. you know, we see that get performed by Trump on January 6th as he gives a, a very boring speech. Our country has had enough. We will not Take it anymore. And that's what this is all about. And to use a favorite term that all of you people really came up with, we will stop the steal. And saying, you know, this amount of people in this state and this thing over here, and we Mm -hmm. tried and we tried. That's just a reflection of the media that people had been consuming online that felt as if it was, you know, uh, that the election was being stolen from this man who uh, represented them. He's literally the embodiment of them and their beliefs. And as I was watching all of those street protests and I was watching what was playing out online around Stop the Steal, it became very apparent to me that they were done, you know, messing with Mitch McConnell and and hoping mm. that Ted Cruz would save the day. And those that went to the Capitol were very clear that they were going there to save Trump. And Mm. based upon the tactics of the past where they were trying to disrupt the certification of electors, were trying to disrupt the vote, uh, it was just very obvious to me amongst, you know, and other researchers that Mm. something was going to go down at the Capitol. So one of the ways you research this and the way you describe these phenomena is through life cycles of media manipulation, and which I think is really important because it treats the ecosystem as the diverse place that it is. And do, does that framing fit the stop the steal campaign broadly defined? And can you sort of maybe, if it does, can you like maybe walk through a little bit what these phases are and how they played out in this case? Yeah. So, uh, The model's fairly simple. It says that there's going to be a moment where there's an opportunity and campaigns will be uh, conceptualized, right? And that people will start to plan them. And then the second phase is when they start to seed that campaign across webs and social. So it could ha- it could begin in a chat room, it could begin on a message board, it could begin in a, uh, you know, a an office park in St. Petersburg, right? There's a kind of conceptualization process that says this is the opportunity. And then you start to see the content start to get, start to be layered online in different forums and and ways. And then crucially is who responds. So we have Mm. so many models of disinformation campaigns that get littered on the internet and then nothing happens. And so importantly for journalists, they have to realize that in stage three, if they choose to respond to something, they may actually trigger uh, more attention and more amplification of that. And so for years, research in our field is really focused on the role that journalists play in amplifying disinformation. 
the fourth stage um, for the first uh, couple of years of doing this research was was relatively uh, absent, which is mitigation, like not just platform companies refusing to take action, but it was really hard to get people to call things disinformation or misinformation. I'm thinking here particularly about the use of Facebook to spread Holocaust denial. Mm. Uh, a couple years ago, Zuckerberg came out and said, hey, listen, I know the Holocaust happened, but if somebody else doesn't know, that might just be a mistake and mm. we shouldn't take that down. Um, and so, you know, mitigation is something that we look very closely at because mitigation actually determines how manipulators adapt and change their targets. Uh, and, right. change. and Zuckerberg, of course, changed that policy. So he did. He, he, he ended, did eventually, which but tells us many things about the whole system. But <laughs> but it also creates a different mitigation strategy, like a different strategy by people who wanted to deny the Holocaust. Right. All of a sudden, yeah, exactly. Like he he really couldn't understand the fact that people in mass, in groups, use that belief to mobilize each other and mm. to and to bring uh, more and different and more toxic Holocaust denial into the world, right? It was, mm. you know, not to get too sociological, but it's about the replication of these worldviews and these ideas mm. uh, that, that social media companies fail to understand is how important their technology is in that repetition and replication. Right. Uh, but when it comes to stop the steal, it was pretty clear over the past few months that Trump was going to, by any means necessary, uh, claim that the election was being stolen and or rigged. Mm. His first line of attack, of course, was against mail-in ballots. But stop the steal as a campaign had been online prior to that. Uh, Roger Stone had registered the domain and had, mm. you know, for 2016, anticipating a Trump loss and a big... Uh, moment to try to mobilize these MAGA folks. Mm. So the the groundwork for Stop the Steal actually existed or, the, you know, prior to November 3rd. But November mm. 3rd, you start to see a constellation of folks come together around Stop the Steal. And the group starts growing so fast on Facebook that Facebook eventually shuts it down. There were through. 330,000 people when I checked in on it. So that kind of spread is is digitally enabled by the algorithmic recommendation systems as well as these networks that were uh, Facebook had tried to remove, which were these QAnon networks that had figured out how to quote unquote go camo as they called it and hmm. and, and, and ingratiate themselves in other spaces on on Facebook, which is like uh I keep joking that Donovan's first law of disinformation is that uh if you leave disinformation to fester long enough, it'll infect the whole product. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the right. QAnon's a good example of that, mm. which is Stop the steal. Then is is being uh, you know pushed across all of these different networks, and then the the mitigation strategy, of course, by Facebook was to try to stop them from joining a very large group, which forced this network distributed model of local stop the steal groups to happen. But through it all, uh, not only is uh, these companies trying to mitigate it, but then you have politicians stepping in saying, um, utilizing that response uh, as a tool to make people think that they're being silenced and suppressed mm. in some way. Mm. And that uh, this forces these groups to move into other spaces, most particularly Gab and Parler. But it's not the case that they're just using Gab and Parler. I want to dispense with this idea that somehow they move off of Twitter yeah. and Facebook and like are just siloed. Right, which is the idea that one QAnon ban moves an entire community off Facebook. Exactly. Which exactly. Didn't happen, it doesn't. Right? It doesn't happen that way. And we have to we have to not get caught up in the corporate logic of the walled gardens here. We have to realize yeah. that people use multiple platforms at the same time. Hmm. And so, yeah, as we were thinking about this and trying and, and we've been writing it up, it's just uh, it, it it's looking as if it's the biggest disinformation campaign uh, that we've seen uh, through through the Internet. Um, hmm. Like, I, I can't think of anything bigger. Right. I can think of hmm. things that are definitely disinformation that have happened in the past, like uh, 
Saddam Hussein had a nuclear weapons, mm. right? That was a kind of lie that was told mm. to justify uh, mm. intervention. But this one is very different because it's using the logics and the appearance or of protest to serve Donald Trump, who's the sitting president. He's not a challenger. And so in mm. that way, he's not an average citizen and he's not someone that's being, you know, just having his accounts taken away from him. Like yeah. if this was the president of another country and that was doing this kind of media manipulation, you know, the, the UN might step in. Right. So, so you mentioned the media framing here and the role that amplification plays in the media. Um, a, a couple of years ago in the lead up to the Canadian election, you, were kind enough to join us for a training session we were doing for Canadian journalists on how they should cover or not cover disinformation in the election. And I remember you um, <laughs> saying in response to a question that, well, maybe you just shouldn't cover it, right? Maybe this stuff just shouldn't be talked about, which is almost common knowledge now in the research community around this stuff. But in a room full of journalists, it 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 doesn't go over well, right? This like challenges their core value proposition and sense of identity, which is we reveal, mm -hmm. uncover truths so that they can be given the light of day, right? No, that's, and that's very true. So when I give that kind of advice about, think twice about coverage, I'm, I'm very specifically talking about extremists and white supremacists. So the Proud Boys contingent of the MAGA coalition is a really important example here, which is to say that there are different ways of covering them. And so Dana Board and I have written about this notion of strategic silence, which is important in the mm. sense that it's strategic, which is to say that you cover things using your perspective, your words, bringing into the fray um, people who are impacted by white supremacist violence and, and rallies, but don't uncritically hand the microphone over and say, well, tell me what, what bothered you as a child that right. left you open to these ideas and made you mm. think that you're superior because they're going to start from the very get by saying, everybody says we're a white supremacist organization, but really yeah. we're not. Yeah. We're just, you know, we're just guys who like to drink and like, you know, like our women in the kitchen and like, don't think immigrants should come, Yeah, you know, like what's wrong with that. Right. And it just gives a whole different platform to their ideas, right? Which is what's mm. happening right now is you have extremists mm. trying to uh, get journalists to cover their different protests. And, you know, some of them are, are six guys in Idaho at the Capitol, like looking around, you know, being like, mm. well, if we can get media coverage, maybe we can get the groundswell of support. And we have to actually approach this now by saying we have power and the things we call attention to matter and therefore, when we cover these things, we have a duty of care to our audiences in providing the kind of context and expl explanation. I mean, mm. I'm giving this advice to journalists in the midst of their editors saying, you can't use the term white supremacist. Right. You can't mention white nationalism. Even in the AP guidelines, things start to shift yeah. around calling people the alt-right so when when we're discussing this, it's really about this moment in journalism where there's a there's a battle between editors and shot callers that are make, that are asking journalists to tell these stories, and then journalists who are really um, uh, caught off guard by the tactics that these groups are using in order to mm -hmm. get attention. And so uh, that's why it's important that we understand this relationship. Now, what happens when Trump gets involved, though, is a mm. completely different order of magnitude because yeah. by virtue of being the U.S. president, he sits at the center of not just media in the U.S., but international media. Mm. And so you can't ignore that, but you surely have to not play into what, him and Giuliani and Steve Bannon and others had really tried to organize, which was a mass disinformation campaign 
um, first against mail in voting. Then they tried to then they tried to plant the Biden laptop story and mm. and New York Times and Wall Street Journal and other Washington Post decided they were not going to cover it in the yeah. way that Trump media was trying to position it. And then we get this uh, iteration of of Stop the Steal that uh, really just gets wild uh, the closer yeah. you look at it. That's an interesting way of framing it as this almost slow build of this big lie, right? They knew this; they needed that trigger of a of a a big, a significant wrong that could mobilize. But and they tried all these strategies to like let that take hold. Um, the platforms responded at the very end of that process by cutting off access. Was that the right time to do it for them, or where do you stand on that debate about when the platform should have cut off accounts? I think we needed a set of rules that we never got um, related to platforms and the responsibility of politicians. We have different different users provide different uses of the mm. same technology, which is to say that if your social media use is uh, largely political, you are a politician, uh, you use social media strategically for political wins. If you're a marketer, though, and your goal is to make money, then the strategic use of social media is about incentivizing people to buy your product. Mm. So different users have different use cases and also then have different incentives for using social media. And bending it to their will then has a lot to do with how flexible the rules are. But... Facebook did a very particular thing, which is they created a carve out for politicians that said yeah. that they were not going to apply the rules to politicians and that they wanted people to see politicians for who they were, quote unquote, warts and all. And this, I think, was a strategically bad decision because mm -hmm. what they failed to account for more so that someone has political power is that they also have network power, right? When you have power in a network, um, you can you can direct people to do different things. You can organize large scale protests, um, which has been a virtue for many about the internet. Is that you know relatively anonymous individuals can use uh, the internet and technology and infrastructure in order to uh, coordinate, organize, and plan large-scale social movements and, yeah. and we've rewarded that use case uh with lots of praise over the years and everything from occupy to black lives matter to standing rock um yeah. you know it's been it's been immensely transformative but in the wrong hands for the wrong ends it's a different technology entirely it's a different infrastructure it seemed like twitter in their post about the ultimate account ban signaled that intentionality of users. And they said, look, we're not just looking at what he said. We're looking at how, what, how he wanted it to be interpreted and how it was received and interpreted by others. Is, mm -hmm. is that a move in the direction you're talking about? Where when we look at speech, we need to look at yeah, we have to look at the context and the consequence. Uh, yeah. This is, you know, the rubric of incitement is important here, which is that in the midst of the the siege on the Capitol, where you you have people who are not just, I mean, we focus on death, but how many people were injured? Mm. How many how many reporters were were punched and kicked and dragged to the ground? How you know how how is our government going to come together across party lines ever again, knowing that Republicans were in favor of not certifying the electors, right? Like these yeah. are existential questions, but the damage that they cause stems from that moment that I described earlier, which is that Trump was airing the grievances and then had told people they had no, not, no other option than to make the capital hear them. So I, I think the the focus on Trump accounts and, and the takedown of the most egregious content ends up being pretty distracting in a lot of this conversation. Um, mm -hmm. Some of this stuff is clearly illegal. 
it should be taken down. There's not a lot of debate about that. It's about capacity and scale and ability to do it. Um, the far bigger problem, as he alluded to, is the 99% of harmful but not illegal content that ends up creating that network effect that causes harm. Um, how do you think the platforms are dealing with that right now? And where do you feel you, their approach is is going wrong here? Because they're clearly not managing it effectively. But Yeah, I mean, I... I hesitate to give any free consulting these days, <laughs> you know, like I, I, you know, my, my attention is much more on what everybody else can do. Yeah. Which is to say that community uh, based organizations, civil society organizations, now is the time for a strong uh, academic and uh, scientifically informed empirical look at where we went wrong and what other yeah. levers of power need to be brought in uh, to correct for just the enormous power that these companies have been able to have at, by virtue, at least in the United States of Section 230. Mm. You know, Section 230 is largely a policy of decontrol. It, it says there's going to be this industry. We want to open it up and re reduce impediment to innovation by saying we're going to get rid of liability for uh, these companies. And in many ways, it creates path dependence mm. for these companies who then see content and the generation of content uh, as um, a way to bring networks together, which is what they then monetize, which is the right. network ties between people. Yeah. And so I don't see a world in which we don't look at those network ties and the money that is generated off of them, uh, off of the data that they generate, off of the side markets around advertising and say, okay, if your platform serves 500,000 people, you need a policy about content moderation that uh, ensures that, you know, incitement harassment, hate, pornography, mm. uh, these things do not, uh, these things are not going to be profitable mm. and include and include disinformation in that, especially as a carve out for politicians uh, who will have to have different rules of engagement on these platforms going forward. Yeah. Um, which is to say, like, I, I'm disappointed like everybody that, you know, Napster doesn't exist anymore. I, you know, still got a lot of those MP3s and any, any yeah. lawyer wants to come for me, you can come for me, but I, none of them are Metallica. I can promise you that. I like, I like some hard rock, but um, I, I bring that up to say that we've been here before. We've had right. these things come and go and they yep. come and go and we shouldn't mm. be so fixated on a future with Facebook yeah. um, that we, we are afraid to create uh, the rules we need to rein in power yeah. and money. And, and fetishizing their power just further entrenches exactly the status quo, right? Yeah. What do you think about Facebook saying, uh, you know, we're acting on real world harms? Like this notion that somehow mm. the internet uh, in, and what happens on Facebook isn't real world. And there's always some interesting connections. I don't know if you know this, but one of the people behind Perverted Justice and the groups that brought that um, To Catch a Predator TV show into the world, yeah. Del mm -hmm. Harvey is in charge of Twitter's trust and safety now. I didn't know she was right, part, And so wow. she was part of those groups. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting to think about. It's like here she, she comes from this group where she's the uh, one of the people that's actually goes to the door and tells the predator to come on in mm. and uh, and spends a lot of time online prior to that trying to enroll uh, predators in this this honeypot. Um, mm. And I think when I think about that connection, I, I think about this notion of real world harm, which the notion of real world harms then mm. becomes very individualized. Mm. It becomes about individuals in their um in their offline world being attacked or, mm. or somehow uh, 
you know, like some predator gains yeah. access to them. Well, a Whereas single they, person being attacked by something single. So two yeah. singular agents, essentially, right? Which is a reductionism that just doesn't work anymore. Yeah. And, and when you think about, well, what happens when you scale that? interaction when you scale mm. that one of the things that was always like really interesting to me about to catch a predator is how it worked every time like there was never <laughs> it was like one of the most perfect television shows in the sense that there was never going to be a lack of people to catch which is to say that the setup conditions online matter and when people don't think there's oversight they don't think there's consequences they're willing to take these major major mm. risks and how I would translate that into the way the policies seem to work is that, yeah, like unless you're out there, you know, getting arrested for um, do, doing hate crimes, like some of the Proud Boys have, have been arrested, not necessarily for hate crimes, but for, for riots, yeah. um, then we're in a different – they're put into a different category of dangerous organizations, for instance, and then action can be taken. Um mm. But I just wonder what the service model is if you were to think about like, well, what is it if you were to build these systems not for growth and openness, but for, you know, as Twitter has said, healthy conversation or uh, more pro-social values and you were to build in a kind of moderation that uh, didn't incentivize uh, Goodwin's law, like about, yeah. you know, how everything online is going to eventually turn into Nazism. Um, you know, like what if, what if you, you took those things seriously and just changed the way that we, we thought about platforms as a service, um, that wasn't about scale. Yeah. One thing I'd love to get your thoughts on is that it feels like a lot of this research agenda emerged, I mean, obviously after 2016, and was really focused on media effects and causality, right? Between, um, and maybe got distract, over, distracted by that. On to what effect did manipulation have and mis and disinformation have on an election? Do you think the the communities moved on from that? And how would you sort of assess the that focus on mis and disinformation now by the community? <laughs> I mean, this uh, this line is so fraught because the people who were researchers that were really pushing this idea that it's more than just social media okay mm. we get it and it's okay to say both and right this is the, the the feminist methodologist in me is to say it's an ecosystem-wide problem and yeah. assigning blame to any one particular industry then um can in some ways overemphasize and release uh, other industries from any kind of culpability. And I'm thinking here about research that really tried to link Trump's victory solely to the um, the news, right? Yeah. And like Fox News in particular and echo mm. chambers and yeah. research that I've tried to do in this space is more about the rationales by which people were using to make decisions about what issues were important to them and and how to vote. Um, but I also like <sighs> voting isn't the only political uh, touch point that people have with the world. People carry out lots of political acts, big and small. Yeah. Um, and so there's definitely a lot more that this field can learn if they were to look at um, disinformation campaigns that animate people's, uh, sensibilities that get them to move off the couch and into the world, which is why we focused a lot on looking at these reopen protests and how they brought together both militia groups with uh, anti-vaxxers, yeah. with uh, the QAnon crowd. I think everybody knows that people form communities online mm. and it's in that bonds, it's in those bonds and in those spaces that people make decisions about, do I go to this protest or not? Do I mm. spend $400 to take a flight to D.C. Uh, to save Trump from uh, the Democrats or, and Republicans 
Um, you know, those kinds of decisions we can look at and we can understand them. Uh, that's a long way around of saying <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, this field has been has been dogged by these debates about impact that are potentially really thwarting our ability to see that people do take action in the world and it's yeah. those actions that we should take seriously. Um, but that speech as well, especially when people repeat things over and over and over again, as they do online, that too is incredibly important to study and understand because I don't think people make much of a distinction between this is my online account for Patriot two, four, six, seven, one, five, zero and my life. Yeah. So one of the interesting things I thought in the last two days has been this international leader response to the, to the Trump Twitter bans. Dass die politische Kommunikation nicht vergiftet wird durch, durch Hass, durch Lüge. And I think so Merkel and a bunch of French politicians and pushing back against it. And I think that's being interpreted as them taking the sides of platforms and sort of the sort of more free speech absolutist perspective. But I actually think it's something very different. It's them saying this is the result of these companies being ungoverned or being being left undergoverned. And they're calling for more, right? They're calling for more govern governance and government, which is I don't think how it's being interpreted in in mm -hmm. the U.S. right now, for example. Um, I'm wondering how you think our policy conversation needs to change in a way that it can get at structure and get at some of these complexities of the way the network functions and of the actors in it and of the design of the system all the thing we things we know to be true how can the policy agenda adapt to that because it's not there now i don't think i mean it's a it's a good question you know i i'm inclined not to believe that these companies really want legislation Right. Yeah, I'm inclined to believe that there's a move happening where on the one hand, they'll say in a very chaotic moment, you know, do whatever you got to do. Like we're over here, like go legislate. And then in the background of all of that, they're employing teams in DC and other people to move the needle away from business models, away from oversight and to offload the responsibility onto uh, either other professions like the whole fact-checking world. So the, the offloading of responsibility onto other professional sectors is something that I talk about as a, as a true cost of misinformation, which is to yeah. say that we could actually figure out what the costs are to journalism that has to pick up the slack. The other part that I'm inclined to think about when they say, yes, we want this, but no, not that way, is to look at the openness of the advertising systems and how they're used adversarially hmm. and how we've seen the weaponization of these advertising systems and uh, when they do uh, roll back uh, people using them, we get different kinds of effects than when their advertising systems are fully open to political operatives. And so the markup has some really great research uh, about this using their citizen browser project where they were able to say, you know, that um, the moment that they, that Facebook reopened the pathway for political advertising, there was an attack on Warnock uh, in Georgia around a cheap fake campaign, which is basically yeah. uh, a very short clip of him saying God damn America from 2013, where he was mm. quoting someone else. Yeah. So, um, so that is to say that I think the, the scale needs to be the target of the policy as well as the, the business model uh, around openness that yeah. produces so many of these ill effects. And the fact of the matter is, is that when these companies say uh, we, we welcome regulation, they mean of a certain kind and type and one that specifically doesn't require them to either break up their businesses or 
uh, create limits for the kinds of profit that they take yeah. in or profit sharing uh, downstream. I mean, Facebook's campaign, which is advertised everywhere now in newspapers, online, on all the main political newsletters, mm -hmm. calling for regulation is, is very clearly more effort going into it being a PR campaign than, than meaningful meaningful reform and you, you consistently hear well we want smart regulations or we mm -hmm. want right like yeah but that's that's a move right if you of offload responsibility and say well these politicians wouldn't do it either uh you oh, know yeah. like we tried like we were just doing we've our been thing asking, and, and we've been asking for it so we've we're been we've been begging yeah. yeah i've been begging for you to clean the dishes and you won't <laughs> do it <laughs> Right, and dish is still dirty, though. And you blame me for breaking the plate? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, right? Um, which is why, like, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm just a lonely researcher over here, all <laughs> over in my silo, unable to see beyond, you know, the, my own self-interest, yeah. right? But I do know one thing, which is that uh, all of the evidence is there that these companies are trying to blame everybody else for the design like it's actually a design problem you know the other thing is we like you imagine technology to be like fast and flexible and responsive but it's really not when you layer on so much bureaucracy as well as um mm. uh, uh a ceo model that has more of a charismatic figurehead yeah. uh model than it does uh pro programmatic approach mm. you end up in this kind of mess where like I mean, like I make this joke a lot, but it's still funny to me, which is, you know, Zuckerberg and Dorsey are the highest paid content moderators on the planet, thanks to <laughs> Trump, right? I mean, well, like- and, and where was Dorsey? He was in like the Polynesian Island, wasn't he making that decision Yeah, might too? as well, like, I mean, yeah, get bad. him out of his like <laughs> sleep chamber and, uh, <laughs> you know, and like, in, in, like get him to get him to comb that beard and then, yeah. you know, get him to read some of these Trump tweets and make some decisions on, well, does a kid stay up? Does it get a label does it get this does it get that yeah. it's a bit different it's a bit easier than uh talking about the very incentive structure of a yeah but of none of it is hey it's millions of users right yeah um, would you rather yeah. have four jets and own an island uh or like not have the the entire world angry with you about your inability to rein yeah. in your technology um, yeah. and apply your own policies to, to people who are, um, using it to overthrow the U S government. I mean, the whole thing sounds like a Will Smith movie, right? <laughs> like I, like I do, I, it, the, you know, if this movie were to be made today, it would be like, well, he seemed like, you know, uh, uh, like he seemed a little off, but mm. you know, charis you know, he's charismatic and. You know, he's on The Apprentice, so I mean, how how much yeah. how how dangerous could he be? And um, you have to stop me, Taylor. I will keep going. Okay, stop, 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 <laughs> stop, stop, stop. Okay, stop. one last question for you. <laughs> yeah. One last question. Okay. Um, you testified to Congress recently. This emerging economy of misinformation is a threat to national security. Silicon Valley corporations are largely profiting from it while key political and social institutions are struggling to win back the public's trust. Um, but you ended by saying, what would it mean to uninvent social media? What did you yeah. mean by that? And what are the stakes in that? So I'm a big, big fan of Donald McKenzie and the STS scholarship on um, uninventing the bomb, hmm. right? This idea that we brought a technology into this world that means we can end this world, right? That's what this, that's what the bomb means is every, mm. like the biggest bomb means everybody dies, the mother of all bombs. Mm. Um, and so I think a lot about the social shaping of tech and this idea that uh, we don't really often think about how to roll back innovation. We don't think about how to uninvent things. We don't have an imagination for a future without something that has been poorly designed and threatens our um, entire existence. And in the case of war technologies, of course, it's a little bit clearer where we go, 
which is to say that we have auditing systems, we have negotiations, there's peace treaties, there's yeah. all kinds of ways, like an immense amount of uh, hand wringing and bureaucracy that is applied to nuclear weapons technologies because this technology exists now mm. uh, and and was brought into this world and and that it is so dire and so terrible that again in the wrong hands could cause massive massive pain and so when i think about how do you uninvent social media it's it's thinking with that lens thinking with those ideas how do we approach regulation uh, and prioritize those who are going to be harmed killed by unbridled uh, social media open and working at scale and mm. you you end up in this position because you don't imagine a world without the mm. technology as it is designed yeah and as it is today importantly right because yeah these exactly these are and constantly evolving but we always take the current moment as the baseline exactly exactly and the current yeah. moment right now is that we finally have seen the important impacts of openness and scale on the public which is to say that you know looking back charlottesville looks like uh a precursor and ominous warning uh if you don't do something now mm. something worse will come kind of moment only because um the future has to happen mm. right it has to play out and yeah. for every person that could have made a decision and didn't or tried to make a decision and uh was thwarted that kind of inaction is so important for us to mm. understand sociologically as the rationale by which we will then get into another situation like this when these groups figure out how to remount an attack with newer and bigger consequences. Yeah. On that note of optimism. No, I mean, optimism. I got cats. I got memes. Like, I got all <laughs> kinds of things keep me optimistic. But, you know, but not, not politics. <laughs> that was my conversation with Joan Donovan. As always, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at taylor at bigtechpodcast.com. Big Tech is presented by the Center for International Governance Innovation and produced by Antica Productions. Please consider subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We release new episodes on Thursdays every other week. Thank you.